Paradoxes can be mind-bending, they can be frustrating, or they can be enjoyable puzzles to solve. Whether they come from the realm of time travel or everyday life, paradoxes can spur some of our deepest thinking and most perplexing views of the world around us. Hi, I'm Rich Burnett for Wondrium. In this episode of Perspectives, several experts cover paradoxes that will make your brain spin. We begin now with one paradox that will change your perception of decision-making for good. Enjoy. Having no choices can be a terrible experience, and research shows that societal limitations on choice reduce happiness for everyone in that society. More liberal countries with more options for their citizens produce greater quality of life. So too little choice is a terrible thing. But the paradox of choice is that too much choice is equally terrible because it becomes paralyzing. Think of how much time and energy you spend on simple basic decisions, type of toothpaste, type of milk, type of yogurt. And then consider that with our abundance of choices, you have to do that every day, all day long, on a million choices, ranging from the small and insignificant to the major and life-changing. The problem with having so many choices is that every decision requires effort. We feel like we're more likely to make mistakes, and we feel the psychological consequences of our mistakes more severely. When we're unhappy, we blame ourselves. We think we made the wrong choice. So no wonder we're all so exhausted. Our environment requires constant cognitive effort just to make it through the day, and then we blame ourselves whenever we get it wrong. The stress over what we think we did wrong can be powerful, even when we've done something very good. One analysis of Olympians found that gold medalists and bronze medalists look happy, standing up there on the winner's podium. Most gold and bronze medalists are smiling. But what about silver medalists? They have the agony of coming close. 43% of silver medalists had expressions that looked sad. 14% looked angry and contemptuous. 29% were stone-faced, expressionless. They were missing the thrill of what they've achieved. They got a silver medal at the Olympics, but it's in the regret of what they missed. They didn't get the gold. So it's a great reminder to think about the places in our own lives where we're so focused on what we don't have that we miss all the great stuff we do have. Some researchers have suggested that one way to make sense of the demands on our time and money is to focus on experiences over stuff. We get more happiness when we spend our money on things we do rather than things we own. Think about a vacation. There's pleasure in planning it, pleasure in going on it, and then pleasure in sharing the photos and telling the stories of it, long after a similarly priced item would just be gathering dust somewhere. Things that create experience, musical instruments, craft supplies, can also lead to the happiness of experience, but only if you actually use them. So a guitar you play boosts happiness over the long haul, the satisfaction of learning how to play, the connection of playing with friends. But a fancy collection of guitars hanging on the wall just becomes another dust collection. So let's talk about strategies you can use to reduce the stress of an overabundance of choice. Using these strategies to lessen the stressors of choice based on our environment of abundance may help you to more effectively manage your energy. For instance, you can actually place constraints on your own freedom of choice. These can be simple. Pick the one type of milk, one type of toothpaste, one type of yogurt you will always buy. Then you don't have to waste energy making that same decision over and over again. If you shop online, pick a few stores and stick with them. If you fly, pick one or two airlines that have good prices and serve your local airport. The benefit is you're spending less time looking at options, and when you get rewards like airline miles, you're consolidating them. And then, whenever you have a decision to make, be okay with good enough. Set the criteria you need, seek out the option that meets your criteria, but don't drive yourself crazy trying to get and have the best option ever. You may have to lower your expectations about your decisions. Not everything has to be the best ever. And you shouldn't beat yourself up about decisions that you make or how they turn out. Do the best you can and move on.
For an example of how a resolving a paradox can reveal something deeper and more important, we could think about Gödel's work, This Statement is Not Provable, where it turns out something deeper is going on. The assumption that it's not provable is just false. It turns out to be incredibly complicated and very interesting. For an example of a paradox that ends up as false, here's one that tricks a surprising number of people. It's called a traveler's paradox. Now, as you'll see, it must contain faulty reasoning. See if you can spot it. Three weary travelers arrived at an inn, and there was a neighbor filling in for the owner, and the neighbor said, I think the room is $30. And so the travelers took out their money and paid $10 each. There were three of them. And they checked in and they got settled. The neighbor wanted to make sure he had the price right. And so he checked with the owner and he had it wrong. The room was supposed to be $25, not 30. So he decided he would take five ones up to the room and pay them back. On the way, he said, I have five ones. How am I gonna divide this up among three travelers? And so he decided he would give one of the dollar bills to each of the travelers and then pocket the remaining two dollars. So now let's think about where the money went. You see, each traveler paid ten dollars and got back one. That's a net of nine dollars. Three times nine dollars is twenty-seven. And the neighbor kept two dollars. That's twenty-seven plus two. That's twenty-nine dollars. Where did that last dollar go? Now, you can sort of see this is more of a puzzle. You know that money doesn't disappear. It's not really a paradox in the technical sense. You know the argument here has to be faulty. But for many, it's quite puzzling, and it's not very obvious where things went wrong. Let's think about where the money is. You see, we added $27 to $2. Adding $27, which is what the travelers paid, to the $2, which is what the neighbor kept, it makes no sense to add those two numbers. The $2 that the neighbor kept it's part of the $27 that they paid. They paid $27, two of, that, two of those dollars is in the neighbor pocket. The remaining $3 is in their pockets. They got $3 back, one each. All the money is accounted for. The $30 goes like this. $3 went back to the travelers, $2 is in the neighbor's pocket, and $25 is with, with the owner. The take home message here is that simple arithmetic can be tricky. In addition to space, surprising things also occur in connection to time in Einstein's theory of special relativity. Picture a mechanical alarm clock. Now imagine that you set the alarm clock to go off in one hour. To anyone that's either stationary or that is moving far less than the speed of light relative to the clock, they will measure that an hour passes before the alarm goes off. But to someone that is moving at a third of the speed of light, it will take an hour and four minutes for the alarm clock to go off. At 90% of the speed of light, it takes two hours and 18 minutes. And at 99.9% .9 of the speed of light, this length of time, which is only an hour in the rest frame, gets stretched to over 22 hours, almost a full day. The most famous illustration of this kind of phenomena is an example known as the twin paradox. So picture two identical twins. One grows up to be a banker and stays on Earth for her entire life. The other grows up to be an astronaut and she travels at a speed of 99.9% .9 of the speed of light to a distant solar system that's located 50 light years away from us. Once arriving there, she quickly turns around and returns to Earth the same way that she came, again traveling at the same speed of 99.9% .9 of speed of light. To those of us on Earth, the astronaut's 100 light year round trip takes just over 100 years to complete. But time passes differently in the astronaut's moving frame of reference. As far as the astronauts concerned, only about four and a half years pass between the start and finish of their journey. This means that the ship's clocks all measure that four and a half years have passed. And the astronaut only ages four and a half years. And she only eats four and a half years worth of food and only listens to four and a half years of music or whatever else she does to pass the time. But on Earth, a hundred years of time and history have passed. And the two twins are no longer the same age. In what was only four and a half years to the astronaut, the astronaut's sister aged 100 years. In all likelihood, everyone that the astronaut knew before leaving on her journey had grown old and died before she got back home. Just take a second to consider how weird and spectacular this result really is. For all intents and purposes, the astronaut in this example has just traveled into the future, making this an example of time travel. 
By moving at nearly the speed of light, the astronaut slowed down the very passing of time in her frame of reference, allowing her to move rapidly into the future. The closer your speed is to the speed of light, the faster you can move through time. In principle, if you can move fast enough, you can move arbitrarily far into the future, a thousand years, a million years, a billion years, or more. But moving backward through time is another thing altogether. And it's with backward time travel that serious logical problems start to appear. The most famous illustration of these kinds of problems is known as the grandfather paradox. Let me describe it to you. Imagine that I follow a closed timelight curve to a point in the past. At this point, I encounter and then kill my own grandfather while he's still a child. As a consequence of these actions, my grandfather never grows up. He never meets my grandmother, and he never has any children or grandchildren. This means I'm never born, and therefore I never exist, and that means I never travel backwards through time to kill my grandfather. So since he was never killed, my grandfather survives to meet my grandmother, and they do have children and grandchildren together. So once again, I do exist. And then, of course, I do travel through time to kill my grandfather, and you can see the problem. Backwards time travel makes it impossible for there to be a self-consistent timeline. The grandfather paradox has been a staple of science fiction since the 1930s. But in addition to producing some very entertaining storytelling, it also serves to illustrate the logical hazards that can come with unrestricted time travel. Any system in which it's possible to change the past suffers from these kinds of problems. And that means that any system containing closed timelike curves seems, to le- seems sure to lead to paradoxical nonsense. To solve the paradox, one must explain why time travel could never allow for the possibility of self-annihilation. To do so, you basically have to reconceive the very nature of what time travel would do. And there are two ways to do this. The first is called branching time travel, a solution to the problem endorsed by philosophers Newell Belknap and David Deutsch. The suggestion is this. When you travel back in time, you do not travel to your own past. You travel to the past of an alternate universe, which has a past just like the universe you left up to the moment to which you traveled but that also contains the event of you, the time traveler, appearing at that moment. You then proceed forward in time in that universe and deal with the consequences of your actions there. But you can't kill your own grandfather because your grandfather is in the past of the universe you left. You traveled to a different universe with a different grandfather. If you kill him, you will simply prevent that universe's version of you from being born. But the event of your birth is still safe and sound in your original universe. This conception of time travel can quite handily be used to make perfect sense of many time travel stories. A second solution to the grandfather paradox was developed by philosopher David Lewis. He suggests that time travel would not give one the ability to kill their own grandfather, because doing so would be impossible, essentially because you'd be predestined not to do so. Why? Well, think back to the block worldview of time, in which the entire universe, past, present, and future, exists as a whole. If time travel is possible, the universe already contains the events of the time travelers traveling in time. Their escapades in what we would call both the future and the past. That means before a time traveler ever activates their time machine, the things that they will do while in the past have already occurred. The past is already written. So they can travel there and experience the past. They can even participate, causing things to happen in the past. But it would be impossible for them to cause anything to happen other than what they had already caused. And since they clearly were born, and thus preventing their own birth is clearly not something that they already caused, it would be impossible for them to do so. Mm 
Hey, thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about the topics in this episode, the full list of series that these clips came from is in the description below. You can watch them all on Wondrium. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel for new episodes of Perspectives, and you can watch previous ones here.